Thank you for joining us this evening for Episode 8 of The Unpleasant Profession of Jonathan Hoag, a science fantasy novella by American writer Robert A. Heinlein. Episode 7 began with Teddy waking from a nightmare and Cynthia seemingly lifeless but breathing. The episode ended with a phone call from Jonathan Hoag. Hoag is someone who came to realize there is a part of his life he has no memory of, an unaccountable loss of time during his waking life. He realized he needed help. It's not a physical sickness, nor mental or emotional. And this is why he had located Teddy Randall, a detective, to uncover this anomaly in his life and help him understand himself. During the phone call, Teddy accused Hoag of causing great harm to Mrs. Randall. Hoag's denial and pleading innocent of any knowledge of the event left Teddy more confused than ever. Episode 8 will reveal the mysteries of Teddy's nightmares and suspense builds about another occult dimension. Cynthia was just as he had left her, looking merely asleep and heartbreakingly lovely. She was breathing, he quickly determined. Her respiration was light but regular. His homemade stethoscope rewarded him with the sweet sound of her heartbeat. He sat and watched her for a while, letting the misery of his situation soak into him like a warm and bitter wine. He did not want to forget his pain. He hugged it to him, learning what countless others had learned before him, that even the deepest pain concerning a beloved one is preferable to any surcease. Later he stirred himself, realizing that he was indulging himself in a fashion that might work to her detriment. It was necessary to have food in the house for one thing and to manage to eat some and keep it down. Tomorrow, he told himself, he would have to get busy on the telephone and see what he could do about keeping the business intact while he was away from it. The Night Watch Agency might do as a place to farm out any business that could not be put off. They were fairly reliable and he had done favors for them, but that could wait until tomorrow. Just now, he called up the delicatessen on the street below and did some very desultory telephone shopping. He authorized the proprietor to throw in anything else that looked good and that would serve to keep a man going for a day or two. He then instructed him to find someone who would like to earn two bits by delivering the stuff to his apartment. That done, he betook himself to the bathroom and shaved carefully, having a keen appreciation of the connection between a neat toilet and morale. He left the door open and kept one eye on the bed. He then took a rag, dampened it, and wiped up the stain under the radiator. The bloody pajama jacket he stuffed into the dirty clothes hamper in the closet. I sat down and waited for the order from the delicatessen to arrive. All the while, I had been thinking over my conversation with Hogue. There was only one thing about Hogue that was clear, and that was that everything about him was confusing. His story, his original story, had been wacky enough. Imagine coming in and offering a high fee to have himself shadowed. But the events since made that incident seem downright reasonable. There was the matter of the 13th floor. Damn it. I had seen that 13th floor, been on it, watched Hogue at work with a jeweler's glass 
screwed in his eye. Yet, I could not possibly have done so. What did it add up to? Hypnotism, maybe? I was not naive about such things. I knew that hypnotism existed, but I also knew that it was not nearly as potent as the Sunday supplement feature writers would have one believe. As for hypnotizing a man in a split second on a crowded street so that he believed in and could recall clearly a sequence of events that had never taken place, well, I just didn't believe in it. If a thing like that were true, then the whole world might be just a fraud and an illusion. Maybe it was. Maybe the whole world was held together only when you kept your attention centered on it and believed in it. If you let discrepancies creep in, you began to doubt and it began to go to pieces. Maybe this had happened to Cynthia because I had doubted her reality. If I just closed my eyes and believed in her alive and well, then she would be. He tried it. He shut out the rest of the world and concentrated on Cynthia. Cynthia, alive and well, with that little quirk to her mouth she had when she was laughing at something he had said. Cynthia, waking up in the morning, sleepy-eyed and beautiful. Cynthia, in a tailored suit and a pert little hat, ready to start out with him anywhere. Cynthia. He opened his eyes and looked at the bed. There she still lay, unchanged and deathly. He let himself go for a while then blew his nose and went in to put some water on his face. Chapter eight. The house buzzer sounded. Randall went to the hall door and jiggled the street door release without using the apartment phone. He did not want to speak to anyone just then. Certainly not to whoever it was that Joe had found to deliver the groceries. After a reasonable interval, there was a soft knock at the door. He opened it saying, Bring him in. Then stopped suddenly. Hogue stood just outside the door. Neither of them spoke at first. Randall was astounded. Hogue seemed diffident and waiting for Randall to commence <clears throat> matters. At last, he said shyly. I had to come, Mr. Randall. May I come in? Randall stared at him, really at a loss for words. The brass of the man, the sheer gall. I came because I had to prove to you that I would not willingly harm Mrs. Randall. If I have done so unknowingly, I want to do what I can to make restitution. It's too late for restitution. But Mr. Randall, why, why do you think that I have done anything to your wife? I don't see how I could have, not yesterday morning. He stopped and looked hopelessly at Randall's stony face. You wouldn't shoot a dog without a fair trial, would you? Randall chewed his lip in an agony of indecision. Listening to him, the man seemed so damn decent. He threw the door open wide. Come in. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Ho came in diffidently. Randall started to close the door. Your name, Randall? Another man, a stranger, stood in the door loaded with bundles. Yes. Randall fished in his pocket for a quarter. How did you get in? Came in with him. The man pointed at Hogue. But I got off at the wrong floor. The beef is cold, Chief, right off the ice. 
Thanks. Randall added a dime to the quarter and closed the door on him. He picked the bundles up from the floor and started for the kitchen. He would have some of that beer now, he decided. There was never a time when he needed it more. After putting the packages down in the kitchen, he took out one of the cans, fumbled in the drawer for an opener, and prepared to open it. A movement caught his eye. Hogue, shifting restlessly from one foot to the other. Randall had not invited him to sit down. He was still standing. Sit down. Thank you. Hogue sat down. Randall turned back to his beer, but the incident had reminded him of the other's presence. He found himself caught in the habit of good manners. It was almost impossible for him to pour himself a beer and offer none to a guest, no matter how unwelcome. He hesitated just a moment. Shucks, it can't hurt either Cynthia or me to let him have a can of beer. Do you drink beer? Yes, thank you. As a matter of fact, Hogue rarely drank beer, preferring to reserve his palate for the subtleties of wines. But at the moment, he would probably have said yes to synthetic gin or ditch water if Randall had offered it. Randall brought in the glasses, put them down, then went into the bedroom, opening the door for the purpose just enough to let him slip in. Cynthia was just as I had come to expect her to be. I shifted her position a trifle in the belief that any position grows tiring, even to a person unconscious, then smoothed the coverlet. I looked at her and thought about Hogue and Popworry's warnings against Hogue. Was Hogue as dangerous as the doctor seemed to think? Was I, even now, playing into his hands? No, Ho could not hurt me now. When the worst has happened, any change is an improvement. The death of both of us, or even sin's death alone, for then I would simply follow her. That I had decided earlier in the day, and I didn't give a damn who called it cowardly. No, if Hogue were responsible for this, at least he had shot his bolt. He went back into the living room. Hogue's beer was still untouched. Drink up. Randall sat down and reached for his own glass. Hogue complied, having the good sense not to offer a toast nor even to raise his glass in the gesture of one. Randall looked him over with tired curiosity. I don't understand you, Hogue. I don't understand myself, Mr. Randall. Why did you come here? Hogue spread his hands helplessly. To inquire about Mrs. Randall, to find out what it is that I have done to her, to make up for it, if I can. You admit you did it? No, Mr. Randall, no, I don't see how I could possibly have done anything to Mrs. Randall yesterday morning. You forget that I saw you. But what did I do? You cornered Mrs. Randall in a corridor of the Midway Compton building and tried to choke her. Oh, dear. But you saw me do this? Uh, no, not exactly. I was... Randall stopped, realizing how it was going to sound to tell Hogue that he had not seen him in one part of the building because he was busy watching Hogue in another part of the building. Go on, Mr. Randall, please. Randall got nervously to his feet. It's no use. I don't know what you did. 
I don't know that you did anything. All I know is this. Since the first day you walked in that door, odd things have been happening to my wife and me. Evil things. And now she's lying there as if she were dead. She's... He stopped and covered his face with his hands. He felt a gentle touch on his shoulder. Mr. Randall, please, Mr. Randall. I'm sorry, and I would like to help. I don't know how anyone can help, unless you know some way of waking up my wife. Do you, Mr. Hogue? Hogue shook his head slowly. I'm afraid I don't. Tell me, what is, th what is the matter with her? I don't know yet. There isn't much to tell. She didn't wake up this morning. She acts as if she never would wake up. You are sure she's not dead? No, she's not dead. You had a doctor, of course. What did he say? He told me not to move her and to watch her closely. Yes, but what did he say was the matter with her? He called it lethargica gravis. Lethargica gravis? Is that all he called it? Yes. Why? But didn't he attempt to diagnose it? That was his diagnosis, lethargica gravis. Hogue still seemed puzzled. But, Mr. Randall, that isn't a diagnosis. It is just a pompous way of saying heavy sleep. It really doesn't mean anything. It's like telling a man with skin trouble that he has dermatitis, or a man with stomach trouble that he has gastritis. What test did he make? Uh, I don't know. I... Did he take a sample with a stomach pump? No. X-ray? No, there wasn't any way to. Do you mean to tell me, Mr. Randall, that a doctor just walked in, took a look at her, and walked out again, without doing anything for her, or applying any tests, or bringing in a consulting opinion? Was he your family doctor? No. I'm afraid I don't know much about doctors. We never need one. But you ought to know whether he's any good or not. It was Potbury. Potbury? You mean the Dr. Potbury I consulted? How did you happen to pick him? Well, we didn't know any doctors, and we had been to see him, checking up on your story. What have you got against Potbury? Nothing, really. He was rude to me, or so I thought. Well, then, what's he got against you? I don't see how he could have anything against me. I only saw him once, except, of course, the matter of the analysis. Though, why he should... He shrugs helplessly. You mean about the stuff under your nails? I thought that was just a song and dance. No. Anyhow, it couldn't be just that, after all the things he said about you. What did he say about me? He said... Randall stopped, realizing that Popberry had not said anything specific against Hogue. It had been entirely what he did not say. It wasn't so much what he said, it was how he felt about you. He hates you, Hogue, and he is afraid of you. Afraid of me? Hogue smiled feebly, as if he were sure Randall must be joking. He didn't say so, but it was plain as daylight. Hogue shook his head. I don't understand it. I'm more used to being afraid of people than having them afraid of me. Wait, 
Did he tell you the results of the analysis he made for me? No. Say, that reminds me of the queerest thing of all about you, Hogue. He broke off, thinking of the impossible adventure of the 13th floor. Are you a hypnotist? Gracious, no. Why do you ask? Randall told him the story of their first attempt to shadow him. Hogue kept quiet through the recital, his face intent and bewildered. And that's the size of it. No 13th floor, no Dretheridge and Company, no nothing. And yet I remember every detail of it as plainly as I see your face. Hmm. That's all? Isn't that enough? Still, there is one more thing I might add. It can't be of real importance except in showing the effect the experience had on me. What is it? Uh, wait a minute. Randall got up and went again into the bedroom. He was not quite so careful this time to open the door the bare minimum, although he did close it behind him. It made me nervous in one way not to be constantly at Cynthia's side. Yet, had I been able to answer honestly, I would have been forced to admit that even Hogue's presence was company and some relief to my anxiety. Consciously, I excused his conduct as an attempt to get to the bottom of our troubles. He listened for her heartbeats again. Satisfied that she still was in this world, he plumped her pillow and brushed vagrant hair up from her face. He leaned over and kissed her forehead lightly, then went quickly out of the room. Hogue was waiting. Yes? Randall sat down heavily and rested his head on his hands. Still the same. Hogue refrained from making a useless answer. Presently, Randall commenced in a tired voice to tell him of the nightmares he had experienced the last two nights. Mind you, I don't say they are significant. I'm not superstitious. Hmm. I wonder. What do you mean? I don't mean anything supernatural, but isn't it possible that the dreams were not entirely accidental ones brought on by your own experiences? I mean to say, if there is someone who can make you dream the things you dreamed in the Acme building in broad daylight, why couldn't they force you to dream at night as well? Huh? Is there anyone who hates you, Mr. Randall? Why, not that I know of. Of course, in my business, you sometimes do things that don't exactly make friends, but you do it for somebody else. There's a crook or two that don't like me any too well, but, well, they couldn't do anything like this. It doesn't make sense. Anybody hate you besides Potbury? Hmm, not that I know of. I don't know why he should. Speaking of him, you're going to get some other medical advice, aren't you? Yes, I guess I don't think very fast. I don't know just what to do except to pick up the phone book and try another number. There is a better way. Call one of the big hospitals and ask for an ambulance. I'll do that. Randall stood up. You, you might wait until morning. You wouldn't get any useful results until morning anyway. In the meantime, she might wake up. Well, yes, I guess so. I think I'll take another look at her. Mr. Randall? Eh? Um, do you mind if, may, may I see her? Randall looked at him. His suspicions had been lulled more than he had realized by Hogue's manner and words, but the suggestion brought him up short, making him recall Potberry's warnings vividly. 
I'd rather you didn't. Hogue showed his disappointment, but tried to cover it. Certainly, certainly. I quite understand, sir. When Randall returned, he was standing near the door with his hat in his hand. I think I had better go. When Randall did not comment, he added, I would sit with you until morning, if you wished it. No, not necessary. Good night. Good night, Mr. Randall. When Hogue had gone, he wandered around aimlessly for several minutes, his beat ever returning him to the side of his wife. Hogue's comments about Popberry's methods had left him more uneasy than he cared to admit. In addition to that, Hogue had, by partly allaying his suspicions of the man, taken from him his emotional whipping boy, which did him no good. He ate a cold supper and washed it down with beer, and was pleased to find it remained in place. He then dragged a large chair into the bedroom, put a footstool in front of it, got a spare blanket, and prepared to spend the night. There was nothing to do, and he did not feel like reading. He tried it, and it didn't work. From time to time, he got up and obtained a fresh can of beer from the icebox. When the beer was gone, he took down the rye. The stuff seemed to quiet his nerves a little, but otherwise he could detect no effect from it. He did not want to become drunk. I woke with a terrified start, convinced for the moment that Phipps was at the mirror and about to kidnap Cynthia. The room was dark. My heart felt as if it would burst my ribs before I could find the switch and assure myself that it was not so, that my beloved waxy pale still lay on the bed. I had to examine the big mirror and assure myself that it did reflect the room and not act as a window to some other awful place before I was willing to snap off the light. By the dim reflected light of the city, he poured himself a bracer for his shaken nerves. I thought that I caught a movement in the mirror, whirled around, and found that it was my own reflection. I sat down again and stretched myself out, resolving not to drop off to sleep again. What was that? I dashed into the kitchen in pursuit of it. Nothing. Nothing that I could find. Another surge of panic swept him back into the bedroom. It could have been a ruse to get him away from her side. They were laughing at me, goading me, trying to get me to make a false move. I knew it. They had been plotting against me for days, trying to shake my nerve. They watched me out of every mirror in the house, ducking back in when I tried to catch them at it. The sons of the bird. The bird is cruel. Had I said that? Had someone shouted it at me? The bird is cruel. Panting for breath, he went to the open window of the bedroom and looked out. It was still dark, pitch dark. No one moved on the streets below. The direction of the lake was a lowering bank of mist. What time was it? Six o'clock in the morning by the clock on the table. Didn't it ever get light in this godforsaken city? The sons of the bird. I suddenly felt very sly. They thought they had me, but I would fold them. They couldn't do this to me and to Cynthia. I would smash every mirror in the place. He hurried out to the kitchen, where he kept a hammer in the catch-all drawer. He got it and came back to the bedroom. First, the big mirror. 
He hesitated just as he was about to swing on it. Cynthia wouldn't like this. Seven years, bad luck. I wasn't superstitious myself, but Cynthia wouldn't like it. He turned to the bed with the idea of explaining it to her. It seemed so obvious. Just break the mirrors and then they would be safe from the sons of the bird. But he was stumped by her still face. He thought of a, a way around it. We had to use a mirror. What was a mirror? A piece of glass that reflects. Very well. Fix them so they wouldn't reflect. Furthermore, I knew how I could do it. In the same drawer with the hammer were three or four dime store cans of enamel and a small brush, leftovers from a splurge of furniture refinishing Cynthia had once indulged in. He dumped them all into a small mixing bowl. Together they constituted perhaps a pint of heavy pigment. Enough, he thought, for his purpose. He attacked the big beveled glass first, slapping enamel over it in quick, careless strokes. He ran down his wrists and dripped onto the dressing table. He did not care. Then the others. There was enough, though barely enough, to finish the living room mirror. No matter. It was the last mirror in the house. Except, of course, the tiny mirrors in Cynthia's bags and purses. And he had already decided that they did not count. Too small for a man to crawl through and packed away out of sight anyhow. The enamel had been mixed from a small amount of black and perhaps a can and a half net of red. It was all over his hands now. He looked like the central figure in an axe murder. No matter, he wiped it, or most of it, off in a towel and went back to his chair and his bottle. Let him try now. Let him try their dirty, filthy black magic. I have them stymied. He prepared to wait for the dawn. The sound of the buzzer brought him up out of his chair, much disorganized, but convinced that he had not closed his eyes. Cynthia was all right. That is to say, she was still asleep, when, which was the best he had expected. He rolled up his tube and reassured himself with the sound of her heart. The buzzing continued, or resumed, he did not know which. Automatically, he answered it. Potberry, uh, what's the matter? You asleep? Uh, how's the patient? No change, doctor. He was striving to control his voice. Mm, that so? Well, let me in. Potberry brushed on by when he opened the door and went directly to Cynthia. He leaned over her for a moment or two, then straightened up. Seems about the same. Can't expect much change for a day or so. Crisis about Wednesday, maybe. He looked Randall over curiously. What in the world have you been doing? You look like a four-day bender. Nothing. Why didn't you have me sent her to a hospital, doctor? Mm, the worst thing you could do for her. What do you know about it? You haven't really examined her. You don't know what's wrong with her, do you? Are you crazy? I told you yesterday. Randall shook his head. Just double talk. You're trying to kid me about her, and I want to know why. Popberry took a step toward him. You are crazy and drunk, too. He looked curiously at the big mirror. And I want to know what's been going on around here. He touched a finger to smeared 
smearing the enamel. Don't touch it. Pop Berry checked himself. What's it for? Randall looked sly. I foxed him. Who? The sons of the bird. They come in through mirrors, but I stopped them. Pop Berry stared at him. I know them. They won't fool me again. The bird is cruel. Pop Berry covered his face with his hands. They both stood perfectly still for several seconds. It took that long for a new idea to percolate through Randall's abused and bemused mind. When it did, he kicked Potberry in the crotch. The events of the next few seconds were rather confused. Potberry made no outcry, but fought back. Randall made no attempt to fight fair, but followed up his first panzer stroke with more dirty work. When matters straightened out, Potberry was behind the bathroom door, whereas Randall was on the bedroom side with the key in his pocket. He was breathing hard, but completely unaware of such minor damage as he had suffered. Cynthia slept on. Mr. Randall, let me out of here. Randall had returned to his chair and was trying to think his way out of his predicament. He was fully sobered by now and made no attempt to consult the bottle. I was trying to get it through my head that there really were sons of the bird and that I had one of them locked up in there right now. In that case, Cynthia was unconscious because God help us, the sons had stolen her soul. Devils. We had fallen afoul of devils. Hopberry pounded on the door. What's the meaning of this, Mr. Randall? Have you lost your mind? Let me out of here. What'll you do if I do? Will you bring Cynthia back to life? I'll do what a physician can do for her. Why did you do it? You know why. Why did you cover your face? What do you mean? I started to sneeze and you kicked me. Maybe I should have said Gesundheit. You're a devil, Potbury. You're a son of the bird. There was a short silence. What nonsense is this? I thought about it. Maybe it was nonsense. Maybe Potbury had been about to sneeze. No, this was the only explanation that made sense. Devils, devils and black magic. Stoles and Phipps and Potbury and the others. Pogue, that would account for, wait a minute now. Potbury hated Hogue. Stoles hated Hogue. All the sons of the bird hated Hogue. Very well. Devil or whatever, Hogue and I were on the same side. Potberry was pounding on the door again, no longer with his fists, but with a heavier, less frequent blow, which meant the shoulder with the whole weight of the body behind it. The door was no stronger than interior house doors usually are, it was evident that it could take little of such treatment. Randall pounded on his side. Potbury, Potbury, do you hear me? Yes. Do you know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to call up Hogue and get him to come over here. Do you hear that, Potbury? He'll kill you, Potbury. He'll kill you. There was no answer. But presently, the heavy pounding resumed. Randall got his gun. Potbury. No answer. Potbury, cut that out or I'll shoot. The pounding did not even slacken. Randall had a sudden inspiration. 
Potbury. In the name of the bird, get away from that door. The noise stopped as if chopped off. Randall listened and then pursued his advantage. In the name of the bird, don't touch that door again. Hear me, Potbury? There was no answer, but the quiet continued. It was early. Hogue was still at his home. He quite evidently was confused by Randall's incoherent explanations, but he agreed to come over at once or a little quicker. Randall went back into the bedroom and resumed his double vigil. He held his wife's still, cool hand with his left hand. In his right, he carried his gun, ready in case the invocation failed to bind. But the pounding was not resumed. There was a deathly silence in both rooms for some minutes. Then Randall heard, or imagined he heard, a faint scraping sibilance from the bathroom, an unaccountable and ominous sound. He could think of nothing to do about it, so he did nothing. It went on for several minutes and stopped. After that, nothing. Hogue recoiled at the sight of the gun. Mr. Randall. Hogue, are you a devil? I don't understand you. The bird is cruel. Hogue did not cover his face. He simply looked confused and a bit more apprehensive. Okay, you pass. If you are a devil, you're my kind of devil. Come on, I've got Potbury locked up and I want you to confront him. Me? Why? Because he is a devil, a son of the bird, and they're afraid of you. Come on. He urged Hogue into the bedroom. The mistake I made was in not being willing to believe in something when it happened to me. Those weren't dreams. He pounded on the door with the muzzle of the gun. Poppery, Hogue is here. Do what I want and you may get out of it alive. What do you want of him? Her, of course. Oh. Randall pounded again, then turned to Hogue and whispered. If I open the door, will you confront him? I'll be right alongside you. Ho gulped and looked at Cynthia. Of course. Here goes. The bathroom was empty. It had no windows, nor any other reasonable exit. But the means by which Potberry had escaped were evident. The surface of the mirror had been scraped free of enamel, with a razor blade. They risked the seven years of bad luck and broke the mirror. Had he known how to do so, Randall would have swarmed through and tackled them all. Lacking the knowledge, it seemed wiser to close the leak. After that, there was nothing to do. They discussed it over the silent form of Randall's wife, but there was nothing to do. They were not magicians. Hogue went into the living room presently, unwilling to disturb the privacy of Randall's despair, but also unwillingly to desert him entirely. He looked in on him from time to time. It was on one such occasion that he noticed a small black bag half under the bed and recognized it for what it was a doctor's kit. He went in and picked it up. Ed, have you looked at this? At what? Randall looked up with dull eyes and read the inscription embossed in well-worn gold letters on the flap. Potiphar T. Potberry, M.D. Uh-huh. 
He must have left it behind. He didn't have a chance to take it. Randall took it from Hogue and opened it. A stethoscope, head forceps, clamps, needles, an assortment of vials in a case, the usual props of a GP's work. There was one prescription bottle as well. Randall took it out and read the prescription. Hogue, look at this. Poison. This prescription cannot be refilled. Mrs. Randall, take as prescribed. Bonton Cut Rate Pharmacy. Was, was he trying to poison her? I don't think so. That's the usual narcotic warning. But I want to see what it is. He shook it. It seemed empty. He started to break the seal. Careful. I will be. He held it well back from his face to open it, then sniffed it very cautiously. It gave up a fragrance, subtle and infinitely sweet. Teddy? He whirled around, dropping the bottle. It was indeed Cynthia, eyelids fluttering. Don't promise them anything, Teddy. She sighed and her eyes closed again. The bird is cruel. End of episode eight.